So hopefully everyone can see that. Here's us. So again, yeah, we are James and Ryan. So my background um, as it comes to birds, uh, ironically enough, Ryan and I were fellow classmates in ornithology class at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington back in 2010. And so that was both of our, real, really our first introductions to, uh, to birding. Um, I also continued on and utilized birds as environmental uh, in indicators uh, in research. So I've studied many of the birds we're gonna talk about today. I sort of utilize their study uh, to understand habitats, to better protect habitats. That has taken me uh, across the coastal Southeast as well as where I did my master's research down in the rainforests of Belize. And I've been birding um, basically ever since I was a kid. Uh, this is something that my dad got me into just as a way to commune with nature, get out in the woods, go exploring and see, you know, just as, as many different species as we can. And it's just a really fun thing to do, especially, you know, during a time where we can't really uh, be close to each other. It's something you can do outside and be socially distanced with. All right, so today we're, we'll be talking about uh, birds of Virginia, specifically those that can be found in the James River watershed, uh, things that can be found different times of the year. Um, we're also joined by Brian Tabor, who's the president of the Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory, and uh, he will get to talk about um, his organization, things that they do, and uh, some pretty neat spots that he's pretty familiar with. And that's one of our... Uh more charismatic watershed species. Maybe some of you have seen that. It's also a declining species across our watershed. It does still have a few strongholds. That's a loggerhead shrike, also known as the butcher bird because uh, they go after prey, but they don't have the talons like a raptor. So they utilize thorns and things like that. But it is something that you can see across our watershed, but it's one of our threatened species. And speaking of our watershed, here's the James River watershed. Um, you can see that it stretches from the Appalachian Mountains in the west, continuing all through the Piedmont, and then down to the coastal plain into Tidewater, where it finally exits into the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, this is a really amazing state to bird in. It's, we have so many different habitats, and just in our watershed alone, we have tidal, very salty uh, marshes down by Fort Monroe, and in the Tidewater, we have freshwater tidal stretches of the river as you get closer to Richmond. We have our Piedmont, we have Blue Ridge once you get past Charlottesville. And then even we stretch all the way on the western edge of this map up into the Allegheny Mountains, which is a complete, another completely different habitat. So it's just an amazing diversity of habitats that we have. Um, gives us a lot of different birds to look at and many other things. Absolutely. So, what we have here is kind of a quick breakdown of birds of Virginia, kind of crib sheet of birds of Virginia. So there have been 481 species recorded as occurring in Virginia. That number actually might be 482 now with a couple of things. I think on the Virginia Society uh, of Ornithology website, it's 479, but there have been a couple of first date records seen uh, late last year and this year. So that number, I think, sits at 481 species. Virginia's ideally placed when it comes to bird diversity. We are right there in the middle of the coastal Atlantic. So we have a lot of species that reach their northern limits from the south, and we have a lot of species that will reach their southern limits from the north that are occurring in our state, and we're also a major pathway for migration, which gives us that really big number um, up up near 500 species. 66% of those, of that 481, have been recorded just in that James River watershed. So that watershed map that we showed you within that area, we've recorded about 66%, um, which is pretty amazing, around 318 species. 224 of those um, breed in Virginia have been recorded nesting in Virginia. So they're utilizing our state and our watershed as an important part of their life cycle. Um, 214 of those are still active. Um, we kind of uh, 
in quotations there for original, 192 quote unquote original species. This is going off since 1900. Um, so what we have seen since um, a lot of colonization, we've had 22 species um, that previously did not nest or breed in Virginia start to nest or breed in Virginia. And we've seen 10 species either go extinct or extirpated. So they are, they exist, but they no longer breed or nest in Virginia. An example of that is called the Bewix wren. So the Bewix wren used to nest in Virginia, um, but it has was pushed out of the state by house wrens as they moved in. Um, so they're not extinct, but they no longer uh, nest in Virginia. 83% of our Virginia species that are nesters can be found in our coastal plain area. So we're talking about Richmond and East. Um, and really amazingly, 25% of our nesting species are wholly or nearly confined to water or water associated habitats. And that is critical. Um, we're, we're gonna be talking a lot about the James River and the role it plays. Um, a quarter of our species depend on these water or water associated habitats that the James River provides. All right, so here's just a fun little web comic of four seasons of birding, you know, things you can expect to see at different times of the year. Uh, songbirds in the spring, you know, wood thrushes uh, singing in the summertime, hawks forming magnificent kettles in the fall, and uh, weird ducks descending upon us all winter long. So <laughs> we are solidly entrenched in weird duck time. And believe it or not, those are all real species in the weird duck time column there. We have a shoveler on the left, a red-breasted merganser opposite him in the background, and that is a drake or male surf scoter in the front. Um, it's a fun time of year. Uh, I'm, I'm using the spotting scope a lot to look at our ducks. I'm gonna take a look at our question box, Ryan. While I... Any chats? Are we not full screen? Yeah, I'm gonna try to make us full screen. I'm gonna make us one screen. second. All right. Is that better? It should hopefully work better once Sweet. we share. All right, so go. hopefully that's fixed that issue. But as far as the chat, we can take a look at what we have going on there. I saw C1 question. Someone mentioned um, that they didn't see winter finches in their bird book. That is an assemblage of different species. It's not just one and we'll address that here in a little bit. Yeah, kind of a collective grouping term for some things that show up in the winter time. All right, so winter on the James River. Um, this time of year actually has probably the largest amount of bird biomass out of uh, any season. You'll find uh, rafts or flocks of, you know, tens of thousands of different ducks all collecting together. Um, they're pushed down from their breeding grounds um, in the north near the Arctic Circle down to where it's warmer in the Chesapeake Bay, James River, um, down towards the Outer Banks. Um, these can include different species of ducks, geese, swans, and they feed on submerged aquatic vegetation uh, such as eelgrass and a whole host of other species. On the land side, um, our forests and thickets, um, especially down the tidewater, our um, hammocks habitats um, are filled with different things, different species of warblers and sparrows that uh, will be in the woods and, and feeding on seeds all winter long. Yeah, so this is where river health really comes into play um, all year long. Um, if we're the healthier the James River is, the healthier our tributaries are, the better positioned that they're going to be to really provide high quality habitat for all of these um, waterfowl that are coming down and are gonna be spending the winter with us. Uh, avoiding that Arctic winter up north. Um, the healthier our rivers are, the, the better the habitat is. So we're talking about sediment, talking about uh, extra nutrients that get in and cause those algal blooms that might choke out 
the grasses that Ryan was talking about. Uh, this is going to affect potentially a large area and lots and lots of birds um, air, during throughout the year, but especially uh, in the winter time. All right, so here's some species of winter birds. Uh, top left-hand corner, that's a bald eagle. Um, at one point in time, there were a total of zero bald eagles in the James River watershed back in the 70s. But now uh, the James River uh, watershed actually boasts the highest amount of nesting bald eagles in the lower 48. There's like 650 pairs uh, breeding on the lower James River alone. Uh, below that on the left is a blue winged teal, one of uh, the main species of ducks that calls uh, the James River home during the winter time. Uh, so that's a male right there or a drake. Um, top left is one you will probably have to do some driving to see. That is not, that is a species of eagle. That is not a bald eagle. That is actually a, uh, a golden eagle. Yeah, the golden eagle is um, something that a lot of people don't think of when it comes to a Virginia bird, but it is uh, something that you can see in Virginia, um, particularly out in the western part of our state, Highland County, Bath County, uh, Augusta County. They come down in the wintertime and will spend the winter out, um, out in those areas. It's a little bit different habitat than the Blue Ridge. Um, so very, very important. There's actually a blue winged teal hanging out at Dutch Gap. Right now, usually the, um, they push through. Not a ton of them will spend the dead of winter with us. They're kind of an earlier waterfowl for us, but great looking male in the, that's there. And uh, you can go see the Dutch Gap right now. Uh, the bottom picture is uh, what's really special about this winter. So that's, a, that's an evening grosbeak. That's one of the many different species of finches um, that, that lives in the boreal forest or the taiga up in uh, Northern Canada. And um, due to a series of fortuitous events for this bird and actually um, the COVID-19 pandemic being one of them, uh, the evening grosbeak is actually down in Virginia in numbers that we just have not seen since the 1970s. So again, those names are um, the bald eagle, the golden eagle, the blue winged teal, really great look at that, and the evening grosbeak. So we were talking about winter finches and we're kind of going to use the evening grosbeak. Um, when we talk about winter finches, we're talking about that. We're talking about purple finches. We're talking about red-breasted nuthatches. We're talking about common red pole um, and several species that come down potentially with us in these what are called eruption years. Um, and so this is one of these times where uh, food was abundant. It's kind of a combination of lots of food and then not too much food coming in the winter time. So what's happened all through their breeding season up in Canada, they had lots of food, in particular spruce budworms. And there's some data and some research coming out actually that 2020 and quarantine might have had an effect on this because there was not a lot of spraying for budworms done, and that may have upped and caused an outbreak that these birds were then feeding on. So basically it's a combination of things. We have a lot of young that were uh, very productive breeding season, and then not a lot of food in the winter. And then they just push south and push south and push south. And uh, usually that doesn't happen, but this year um, it has. And like Ryan was saying, especially for the evening gross beaks, that has not happened in good numbers since, since the seventies. I do see someone in the chat has brought up the James River Park system in Richmond. Yes, those have been some of the most reliable evening gross beaks in the state. I think they're still there. Um, Shirley Plantation, and this is talking Tidewater, Shirley Plantation along the James has also been pretty reliable for evening gross beaks. There's a stand of trees on the road into Shirley where they have been. Um, if you are in and around Richmond and interested in seeing those, um, Pony Pasture, I believe, is the um, you know, where they have been pretty reliable. They're kind of nomadic. They move around in groups. They're following food sources. Um, so your best bet um, in and around Richmond, Pony Pasture, and then um, other places, look, look out for your feeders. Yes. They love black oil sunflower. You never know. You could just get descended upon one day by a flock of them. They, they don't really stick around too much. They mm -hmm. just, uh, they rove around. They don't really stick in one place for too long. So definitely just keep your eyes peeled this winter. Yeah, they're going to look like a giant version of your goldfinches. You have goldfinches coming to your feeders already. 
There we go. So um, what we have here are a couple of IBAs or important bird areas. These are designated by the Audubon Society. And so for each of our seasons, we're gonna kind of highlight some important bird areas that play a role in that season. They're important all along the year, but we'll highlight them for certain seasons. And we'll talk about some locations to go and how important um, some of these locations are and what you can see there. So on the left, we're looking at this area. This red area here that's outlined by, that's the tip of Highland County. Um, that's the Allegheny Highlands IBA. Uh, it's an amazing place. Um, Highland County, if you're a bird watcher, it should be on your list to go and see. It is absolutely amazing. Um, very different habitat to anywhere else in the state. Has the, the highest concentration of American kestrels in the state. Um, Golden Wing Warbler has a stronghold there. Golden Eagles are there in the winter. Um, it's a patchwork of, there's way more uh, livestock out there than people. I think Highland County is the least populated county in the state, Ryan. Yeah, I think there's only about 2,000 yeah. people that live in Highland County. An amazing, amazing place to go bird watch. Um, kind of just cruising the roads out there. There's not even a lot of vultures in Highland County. If you see a big dark bird and you're driving around in Highland County in the winter, chances are it's a golden eagle, which is kind of amazing. Rough-legged hawk, which is another yep. rare winter visitor. They are several around in the state this winter, but Highland County is usually a hot spot for them. So that is uh, in our watershed. And then the other one here on the other side is the Lower James River IBA. And that is basically the stretch of the James River from the mouth or just above the Chickahominy River to um, Dutch Gap, just as we get into Richmond. It is the tidal freshwater section of the river. So tidal, but basically still um, fresh and hugely important area. This area houses the largest concentration and highest populations of water birds in the state. So we're talking egrets, great blue herons, ospreys, bald eagles, you name it. Um, hugely important area for migrant bald eagles. So we have our um, residents and we have a lot that will spin and migrate through. Um, hugely important area for grassland species on this part of the state, um, grassland habitat is hard to come by uh, in this part of the state. So very, very important in the winter time, probably the highest concentration of numbers of waterfowl and geese in the state are gonna be found here. The first state record for pink footed goose was found in this area, uh, probably spending the winter right on our own James River with a group of Canada geese was inside that area. Um, so some places inside that IBA or near it to go and bird watch are gonna be Jamestown Island itself, really great place. There's the Island Loop Drive. Um, you can drive it or some, it's really great place to walk and bike. There's a three mile loop and a five mile loop. Um, Hog Island is a little bit more complicated to bird watch, but it is very worth it. It is one of the best places, should be on your list of places to go, to go birding in the state. So this Hog Island is the area behind uh, Surrey Nuclear Power Plant. And so you do have to go through the check station to get in um, and you need a state wildlife management area uh, permit pass to go in but it's amazing it's one of the best places to go birding in the winter time it is the place to see american white pelicans in the state um, uh, dutch gap if you're in the richmond area dutch gap is great all the time in the winter time right now a lot of people are going out there um, that blue wing teal is there i think there's juvenile male eurasian widgeon out there. So yep. normally we have our own American widgeons, but we do sometimes get a Eurasian widgeon. I see a great question in the chat of getting the access permit. It's just on um, DWR's website. It's something you can get like a hunting license. You can even get them at uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. I think they cost 20 or $25 for the year and it lets you um, go into any wildlife management area in the state. Great question though. Sweet. Yep, oh, gotta get rid of the we can annotation. Erase. There we go. All right, sweet. So springtime, that's a very classic um, time of year to go birding. Uh, that's someone. that's generally when um, we see just masses of like hundreds of thousands of songbirds, such as warblers and thrushes. Um, 
all kinds of different passer and birds are pushing north. S same with uh, raptors, uh, like broad winged hawks and, uh, you know, shorebirds, tons of things like black bellied plovers, ready turnstones, uh, semi palmated plovers, all kinds of sandpipers. All of them are making a mad dash from their wintering grounds down in the tropics uh, to either the northern United States, the boreal forest, or in some cases, all the way to the Arctic Circle. Oh, yeah. And, There's uh, actually a lot of shorebirds you can see inland. So we think of shorebirds as beach down at the coast, eastern shore of Virginia, Virginia Beach. There's actually quite a, quite a lot of shorebirding that you can do, even in the Shenandoah Valley, believe it or not, um, that, that come up further away from our uh, coastal, true coastal areas. Um, birding in the spring, uh, May especially, <laughs> you know, it's, it is the month to go birding. Uh, it's take as much time as you possibly can yep. in May because they are coming through and there are a lot of species that are only going to be with us for that month or so yep. as they continue north. Um, where to go birding when it comes to in the spring to see our warblers when they're in their nice breeding plumage, mature hardwood trees, so big hardwood trees, big oaks, um, tulip poplars are really great when they're flowered. They provide significant food sources for these birds coming up. So basically, if you want to go birding in the spring and you want to see warblers, you can go to some mature hardwood trees where the sun, the dawn sunlight is hitting the tops of these trees in the morning. It's heating up and getting the insect activity going. And that is where you're going to find those songbirds that have dropped out overnight. A lot of them are migrating at night and they're going to drop out. And then a lot of times they'll spend the day feeding with us and they're active in those uh, big hardwood trees that are harboring the insects and when the sun is hitting first, uh, very, very important places to go. So even around your house, if you're walking around, if you know like, hey, there's, some, there's a great patch of old trees there, sunlight comes up, even better if you can get the sunlight behind you because it's no fun to look at backlit birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard to identify where stuff when the sun's coming behind them, but uh, that's what you want to look for. Fair warning, you probably will experience something called warbler neck <laughs> because you will have to look directly straight up with your binoculars <laughs> and anything longer than about five minutes yeah, with that. This is the fun warbler game in the spring is trying to look up. That's why we'll talk about a place you can go where you can see warblers and not have to do that. <laughs> All right, so here's some springtime birds. Um, top left-hand corner, this is a scarlet tanager. This is... Uh, you know, really brilliant red bird. Um, this actually breeds here in the state, um, in the mountains and in northern Richmond Virginia. too. Yeah, oh, and beginning in Richmond. Yeah, that's right. Um, below that, on the bottom left, that yellow bird. That is another uh, bird that will uh, breed in the state. Um, residents of our uh, wetlands and swamps. Uh, it's the prothonotary warbler. Another nickname for it is the canary of the swamp. Yeah, that's a really I think one of the most charismatic, emblematic birds of the James River. A lot of what we know about prothonotaries actually was research that came out of um, VCU and Dr. Charles Blim's lab for a very long time. They are generally pretty unafraid of people. Um, a good place to see them, especially in the lower watershed, is Newport News Park um, over on the Swamp Bridge. Um, they'll, they'll be pretty curious. The males, when they're establishing their territories, will probably fly right past your head and land on a branch and look at you, wonder what you're doing there, and then go back to, you know, singing his head off. Yeah, for us down in the coastal areas, scarlet tanagers are a spring migrant. You can get them in the spring. They are going to be resident um, in Richmond and West, a lot of in the mountains, really great bird. And prothonotaries all across the watershed, um, certainly really high numbers for us around Richmond. Any of the James River Park system in Richmond is going to harbor these guys. The males, like you see here, they get here first. So the prothonotary males will generally arrive mid first, middle to third week of April, and they are going to be setting up a territory. They're going to be singing like crazy. They're all hopped up and ready. And what they're doing is, is they're going to be flying around setting up their territory. And they're going to um, make their territory so that they have at least four cavities to build nests in. So they are one of our only cavity nesting warblers. I think there's only two or three species, and this is the only one out east that nests in little cavities. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna make and defend his territory by singing and chasing off other males. Totally, they'll, they'll go about this without, even if you're standing there, I've seen them fight in the trails with each other, they don't care. 
flown right past my head in my canoe. They are so focused on what they're doing, but he's going to um, set up these four cavities. He's going to build the base nest. And then the females show up a little bit later. And she's basically going to travel around to all of these males and they're going to be singing to impress her. And she's going to look at the cavities. And if she chooses that male, she'll then pick the cavity she likes, build the rest of the nest, and then they'll start nesting at the late April or early May. And they can actually nest more than once. Um, and that's a really great, very loud, they say, sweet, 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 sweet. Very loud, very ringing call. If you're in and around the river at all in from April all the way through June, July, it's something, it's just a call of the river. Um, really great one. On the upper side of the other side there is a Sydney palmated plover. It's one that comes through. That photo was taken on Grandview Beach. Great place to go birding. Um, a lot of things will utilize Grandview Beach. On the way up, we even get horseshoe crabs that will uh, crawl up on the beach yep. there. A little bit outside the watershed, but what's great about semi palm plovers is they love farm fields too, sod farms. And anytime when it's been wet, um, really good time to go shore birding in the spring is in April mm -hmm. after it's been wet. Sod farm, a farm field, um, they'll drop out in these wet areas. And semi palm plovers is one of our more common ones that's going to be in there. It's also some really cool uh, rares that you can potentially get in spring, but that's a really great bird. So below that is um, the yellow crowned night heron. Uh, that's another species of wading bird that we have on um, the breeds in the state. And they are um, actually crab specialists. So they generally only eat crabs. Uh, there's another species of night heron. You can find another habitat, uh, another habitat, and that would be the black crowned night heron. Um, yeah, that photo was actually taken on Fort Monroe in Hampton, which has um, one of the larger nesting colonies of yellow crowned night herons in our watershed. Yeah. You can go see them there. Um, they're right around people's houses. They're pretty unafraid. In April, you can see them doing their display. They'll um, throw their wings back and they, they can throw up that yellow crown um, out there at Fort Monroe. So here's another important birding area. Yeah, so we're looking at this red area here. Um, you see Lynchburg, you see Charlottesville. So this red area is the Upper Blue Ridge IBA. So we're talking about the crest of the Blue Ridge. So part of that's gonna be in our watershed. The other side is it drops. Um, it's gonna partly be in the Potomac, but we have a lot of it. Super important habitat, um, home to a lot of our really great warbler species that breed in the state. Black Bernie and warbler, Cerulean warbler. These are must have species that people really wanna see. Very important area for them during migration and um, for breeding. So anywhere along the Blue Ridge Parkway, just on the pull-offs is a great place to go bird watching. Um, drive along the parkway, pull off, and listen in springtime. I mean, it, the songs are calling out to you. There's a lot of really great birds to see up there on that forest at the top of the mountain. Um, James River Park System in Richmond. I've gotten several really great lifer warblers from James River Park System in Richmond. Bay-breasted probably being the, uh, the bay-breasted warbler, probably being the best one. One of Ryan and I's favorite places that uh, we can walk to from our office and go birding is the Jamestown Glass House. So if you're in Richmond or down here in the Tidewater, um, the Jamestown Glass House is the perfect storm for migrants. It's by the it's near the James River, so that big water body can stop birds. They don't like to cross big water necessarily. They'll drop out at night. It's got big hardwoods, tulip poplar is the main one, and the sun hits it in the morning. And what was really great this past spring is that it was closed. <laughs> the park, the blue, to the county parkway was closed to traffic, so there wasn't even any car noise. It was amazing. Uh, still really great, even when there's cars. Go and park at the glass house in the morning and just lap the parking lot. Um, I've never seen or heard more black pole warblers in my life than at the glass house. <laughs> uh, that used to be a hard bird for me. It's a generally uncommon warbler to get, and uh, for whatever reason, um, the glass house is a really important stopover area for, actually for the species as they head north. Lots and lots of Cape May warbler we get there, yellow mm -hmm. warbler, um, really great, easy place to go bird. Like I said, you can park there and just, and the trees aren't even too tall. The sun mm -hmm. hits them, you can find them bouncing around up in the tulip poplar blossoms, um, really great place. And like we said, anywhere with mature hardwoods, dawn sunlight. Um, I like to go, if you're down coastal, I also like to go um, to Lions Bridge near the river. Um, that's a really great place to get some great birds. And then the Rivanna Trail in Charlottesville, 
uh, one of our great tributaries. They, you can get some really great migrant warblers in parts of the Rivanna Trail and up and around Charlottesville as well. But the all time should be on your bucket list to go bird watching on in the state and in, in our watershed is Warbler Road. And this is actually a series of fire roads that connects the Blue Ridge Parkway at Apple Orchard Falls Trailhead and Arcadia, the town of Arcadia down on 614. Um, you cross the James River and you go on to 81. It's actually um, just a little bit north of Roanoke. Um, so believe it or not, still in our watershed. And it is amazing. So you start off at about 3,800, I think it's 3,750 or so feet. Um, you drop 2,700 feet as you drive from the Blue Ridge Parkway down to the James River. And these are forest roads. They're not even paved. There's nothing out here. Um, it's 13 miles and it is unbelievable. You drop through elevation gradients. So the warblers change as you go from the top to the bottom. So up at the top, you've got Canada warbler, Blackburnian warbler, chestnut sided warbler. As you go through the middle, cerulean, worm eating, drop down, you get prothonotaries, black and whites, American red starts. Um, on a good May day at Warbler Road, you can get it's, it is possible to do the upper 20s and get close to 30 species of warbler in a day if you get lucky and are diligent. Um, it is just an amazing, um, really amazing that we still have it, that it hasn't been um, developed through there. It's just Blue Ridge Forest. Uh, what's great about this is that you can stop and the birds, the canopy that you're looking at on the downslope side is at eye level. So no warbler neck. <laughs> <laughs> you're not having to do warbler neck. They're right at your eye level or below where you're higher than them, um, which is really great. And there's lots of other species, scarlet tanagers, rose-breasted grosbeaks that are up there. Uh, a really, really amazing place to go. Um, DWR has a webpage all about Warbler Road. If you type in Warbler Road, DWR will take you right there. Uh, it'll give you the road directions um, to do that, to follow. Amazing, amazing drive. Um, if you're intrepid, you park at the top. And have two cars it's 13 miles it's all downhill though if you're feeling and uh, you can do a lot more birding if you walk it or bike it down um but very much worth the trip out all right so summertime generally that's a pretty slow time for migration <clears throat> things are uh, basically staying put in their breeding um but in the james river watershed probably the most important place uh to go birding is now fort wool it's um an old abandoned fort, uh, I probably actually predates World War II, uh, actually directly in the mouth of our river and uh, home to like over 15,000 nesting, uh, nesting seabirds are there, including different species of terns, gulls, um, uh, brown pelicans. It's one of the only places in the entire state you can find gull billed terns nesting. Um, there's, and there's only maybe about a one or two dozen of them. And the mouth of, the mouth of our river hosts um, all kinds of uh, fish biomass for them to, uh, to feed on. So uh, certain birds like black skimmers, um, they're clo somewhat closely related to uh, other terns, but their lower jaw is longer than their upper jaw. And then they'll actually uh, fly low over the water with their uh, lower mandible in the water and then they'll like snap up fish. And you can see those uh, going to, um, going to, uh, to feed their chicks. Yeah, it's amazing. So if you go over the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, this is where we're talking about. Um, kind of easy to see, more easily to see it if you're coming from Norfolk. And they actually have barges set out there um, as additional habitat um, for the for the nest on. So you may have heard about it in the news. Um, you know, they're doing construction down there at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. This colony was on the Tunnel Island, the South Tunnel Island, um, but they have successfully moved over um, to Fort Wool and these barges, uh, which is really, really great. Um, we did definitely did not want to lose them. I'm going to check the chat real quick. So I see someone put the uh, Warbler Road link in the chat. Thank you for that. Best month is May for Warbler Road. For all warblers and spring migrants, May is going to be your best bet. The Glass House is in Colonial National Historical Park, uh, right off the Colonial Parkway, and that's uh, located in Williamsburg. 
And yes, prothonotaries come up above the fall line. You can get them all across. Those prothonotary rovers are all across the watershed. Dutch Gap is great. Deep Bottom Park, if you're around Richmond, is really great. I've paddled at Deep Bottom and they're just flying around. They don't care. All right. Okay. Here's some summer birds. Um, a really classic one is yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, you know, some old timers like to call that the storm crow because you, you'll hear them calling in the woods when it's the absolute hottest time of the year, um, particularly when there's lots of thunderstorms rolling through. So people used to think that um, they were calling because they thought that a storm was coming, but they're just calling because they like to do that when it's really hot and abysmally humid and there's lots of thunderstorms in the area. Um, summer tanager is in the top right hand corner. That's another species of tanager, brilliant red. Um, that's another uh, one that you'll see all over the place in the summertime. Um, you'll hear them calling from the trees saying like picky duck, picky to, duck. to each other. Oh, no. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, brown pelican, uh, lower left hand corner. Uh, there didn't used to be too many brown pelicans in the James River watershed, and that was because of the DDT crisis from the 1970s. Um, a pesticide was uh, actually, yeah, it was a pesticide, I think primarily for mosquitoes, and it was just being sprayed everywhere, and that caused eggshells to weaken for many bird species. Peregrines, um, bald eagles. Peregrines, yeah. bald eagles. And that really affected brown pelicans pretty hard. Um, it weakened the eggshells, so the parents would go to incubate their eggs, and they would just crush the eggs, and they wouldn't be able to raise any young. But since DDT was outlawed, uh, brown pelicans and many, many other species, such as bald eagles and peregrine pelicans, have really uh, been able to rebound. And the uh, lower right-hand corner is an orchard oriole, um, species of blackbird, uh, one of our one of our favorite ones. Yeah. So for us down at the summer oriole is the orchard oriole. Um, in winter time, uh, you can start to see Baltimore is actually in the winter, but for the rest of the state, you have both Baltimore and orchard. Uh, you do have to go to Richmond and parts of the West, um, but orchards, uh, that's a male orchard oriole. You'll see the orchard oriole juvenile male will look like that. But instead of that sort of rust color, he's kind of yellow um, colored. But yeah, brown pelicans are um, you go over the James River Bridge down here, there's a lot of them flying around these days, which is uh, great to see. Very have good sign that the fish stocks and things in the river are. Have you, have you seen them as far up river as the Benjamin Harrison Bridge connecting mm -hmm. Prince George and uh, Charles City counties? Yeah, the Benjamin Harrison Bridge actually has nesting peregrines. The James River Bridges um, have several nesting peregrine falcons. Um, so those of us in Richmond might be aware of that. Um, those typically those chicks are taken by DWR and hacked, put in hack boxes up in um, uh, up in the mountains. So they don't have very good survivorship at the Benjamin Harrison, the James River Bridge, um, but we do have uh, lots of nesting peregrines in the watershed and right on the river. Um, the James River Bridges in Richmond also host our largest colonies of um, swifts and swallows as well. Okay. So an important IBA um, in summer, when the well, actually the newest and the largest one that we have uh, is called the Central Piedmont IBA. So you see Lynchburg. We're talking about this big area around um, Charlottesville and the Piedmont. That's uh, a patchwork of you know uh, forests, farms, grasslands. Um, supports a lot of our declining uh, resident species, wood thrush is important in there. Kentucky warbler, really great one that like people like to get, hard one to get, very skulky, very thick underbrush. Um, great bird to get in Virginia, the Kentucky. Um, one of the big issues with Kentucky is actually deer browse. So deer will eat out the understory and Kentucky warblers really like that thick, uh, thicker understory. Um, very important area for them. A lot of our resident birds in there. Um, if you're in this area, you know, I think you have really, you're in a really great spot. Um, you're close to the Blue Ridge Mountains. You also get some of our coastal stuff. Um, really great place to be. Um, but it's where this is less of a specific area, more of a pretty large um, part of our state. So anywhere in there, if you're at home in your neighborhoods or parks like Ivy Creek in uh, 
Charlottesville, a great place to go. All right, so fall, that's the other really big migration time of year. This time of year, it's gonna be much harder to identify warblers. They lose their colorful breeding plumage. They stop calling to each other and they're just trying to blend in as much as possible. So it's, you can identify uh, fall warblers. It's definitely more of a challenge. This is a great time of year to see uh, large numbers of hawks gathering together in what's called a kettle. Um, you can find tens of thousands of hawks all migrating together, uh, pushing south. Um, a big spot for that is Afton Mountain. So as you take 64 over, um, you're still in our watershed. As, of course, when you go Afton, you're no longer in our watershed, but right there on top, it's a big channel for our raptors. There's a hawk watch that you'll learn more about. Uh, hawk watch is a general you know, later, but there's a hawk watch that, that goes on top of Afton Mountain there to see raptors. And farmland is really critical habitat, particularly cornfields, especially after they harvest the corn. Uh, that's a great place you can find uh, different plovers and shorebirds, uh, things like Wilson snipe um, are perfectly camouflaged to blend in. Um, people think like, you know, snipe hunt, oh, I'm gonna send my friend to go find something that's imaginary, but snipe are real birds. Um, they're, <laughs> they're a species of shorebird and uh, they're just really secretive. Um, but if you have a discerning eye, you can see a lot of them uh, congregating together in these fields. Yeah, our grazing lands, um, pasture lands, um, open habitats is in the valley, in the western part of the state even, uh, are great for shorebirds, American golden plovers, and many other things um, will show up. So great places to, if you're out there, ride around after a rain in the fall, uh, they are coming through in abundance. Here's some fall birds. Um, Left-hand corner, that's a broad-winged hawk. That's actually one of our smaller raptors, but that's uh, one that will uh, move in these really gregarious flocks with just hundreds or maybe even thousands of them together. Upper right-hand corner, that's um, a black-bellied plover in its non-breeding plumage. That's what it's probably going to look like in the fall. And you can see its characteristic black armpit mm -hmm. as it's flying. And then at the bottom, that's the Wilson snipe. That's the, uh, the classic snipe hunt bird, but that's what they look like. Um, <laughs> they, they blend in really well and they much rather run away from you than fly or even better yet, just sit very still and rely on their camouflage. I have almost stepped on them. They're so reliant on camouflage. Great question of color patterns on fall birds. Um, it's a lot of birds will put on a breeding plumage that's actually known as alternative plumage and fall plumage is referred to as basic plumage. Um, so the male might put on a more elaborate plumage uh, to attract a mate, whereas um, come the fall, they're going to maybe put on some feathers that allow them to survive a little bit better, maybe make them look a little bit less conspicuous. So speckling and browns like this on our shorebirds are something that's gonna be important. So you don't get picked off by a peregrine falcon as you move south. Um, if you still have some breeding plumage on, you might be more susceptible to, uh, to predation. Um, so you're gonna try to blend in with the ground as best you can. Um, and it's very energy costly um, to pretend, and with pigment and everything else to keep up these breeding plumages. So they'll uh, revert to their basic plumage in the fall. Great question. All right, so uh, Brian, uh, we'll turn this over to you. This is Brian Tabor. He is the president of the Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory, and he's one of the best naturalists and definitely one of the best birders that we have in the state of Virginia. So Brian, you can take it away. Am I, am I unmuted now? You are unmuted. Yes. Well, great, great job for you guys. That's a great overview of, of what's going on in Virginia and especially in the watershed. Um, I'd like to start by saying I feel really lucky to be in this part of Virginia because that's really where the birds are. And I started out years ago, like in the 80s, right when the Williamsburg Bird Club was forming. So I've been with that organization. They do a spring count at Hog Island and this whole area. They do a Christmas count. And then I got involved with Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory in 94, 
So I've been in, involved with two great organizations that have been doing bird work for, for decades and getting to see a whole lot. So I'm extremely, extremely fortunate about that. Um, yeah, you were going to put the website up. Um, people can yeah. navigate, people can navigate that later on on their own. Um, but you'll see that we do things like the hawk watch over at Kipta Peak on the eastern shore. We do pathonotary warbler nest box studies, which you guys have already talked about, which is a really yeah. exciting thing. And yes, VSU, uh, VCU is the umbrella organization that's been structuring that work for decades. Uh, we do water bird studies at places like Craney Island, uh, which is private, um, but the Army Corps of Engineers keeps the, um, the James and Elizabeth River open with dredging and they have formed a place where just tens of thousands of birds come all the time. So we're there re weekly to try to make sure that the contractors aren't digging and working in places where birds are trying to nest and, and, and feed, so. And we do a lot of butterfly work too. You'll see that on the website. Uh, You've got a picture up there of uh, College Creek at the bottom. Uh, we do the only uh, winter and spring hawk watch in Virginia. And we've been doing that since 1997. And you heard them mention Hog Island Wildlife Management Area. That's the scene across the water there. And on this side is the Williamsburg and the Colonial Parkway, not far from Jamestown. So we set up there in the parking lot with a few people and we count the birds that are coming across the river. We've been doing that for years. A lot of them are turkey vultures. Um, but they're a, a big migrant species as well. And yeah, that's a map of it at the on the top there. You guys have turned up some pretty good stuff on that hawk watch over the years. Yeah, yeah, it, it's great. And, it, and it's not just hawks, shorebirds and waterfowl, swans um, will come by too, but it's, it's been great. And we've seen a lot of changes over the, over the years too. Yeah, that little point of land in the upper picture is kind of a a directional marker when the birds get out there they're already halfway across the river and they just go on across and come to our site on the north shore there and this is craney island um, a really important place and it's not far from the seabird colonies that james and ryan mentioned that are at the bridge tunnel which is only just a couple of miles away across the water so that whole area is full of fish and full of birds and in the summertime, it's just alive with, with nesters. So the upper left picture is an aerial picture of Craney Island. And that site is about two miles square. Um, and then you can see three big rectangles in there. And the Army Corps puts all the dredge spoil in there. And it's just a muddy area, um, almost always um, two or three inches of water, sometimes a little bit more than that. And it's just uh, in, in wet weather, it just fills up with birds. And it can look um, real muddy and awful some of the year, but the picture on the upper right shows that if they let it go for a while and don't work there, the grasses grow up and it looks very much like a natural area that you would see like a, a Western slough or something like that. And in the bottom left, that's what they're doing there all the time. They're just constantly digging and moving um, the sediment around so that the, the ships can navigate on the Elizabeth and the James River. Uh, one of the important nesting species down there that we monitor is black neck stilts. It's one of the only two places in the, in the state that have those nesting. And another bird that we study down there is leaf tern. Yeah, the one of the other great ones um, from Craney is American Abisset. And uh, those have recently been seen in Newport News actually making the jump um, probably from Craney um, yep. over to King Lincoln Park here on our side of the river, which is very exciting for us. Not something that we do uh, get to see a lot. And as Brian mentioned, um, it is private. It's Army Corps of Engineers. But um, in the past, they do have scheduled bird walks that do um, go out there. Very competitive to get a spot on these walks. But um, it is certainly something to look um, look at doing and being a part of because there are a lot of birds at Craney that you can't see anywhere else in our watershed. Um, or for the state. Or for, for the state, for yeah. that matter. Um, Brian, when do they usually do the walks at Craney? I think August has been the big time for the VSO. It's, uh -huh. the big, it's the big push of young birds that have just hatched from the north and they're coming south. So uh, May would be a great time too, but I think they've tended to go um, in, in August. Okay. Be prepared to deal with mosquitoes if you go on the Craney. Uh, trip. 
Uh, that is the price to pay for <laughs> hundreds of Avocets. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one thing about Avocets is a couple of years ago, we photographed them actually mating. And we don't know what they're doing in the East because there's so many of them and there's no breeding colonies that we know about, but they're actually attempting it if they're mating. So we're hoping to find a nest down there some year. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Brian, yeah. for those uh, insights. So yeah, look for them on the Colonial Parkway at College Creek, um, parked out there in the mornings. Um, say hey, and uh, they, they find a lot of cool stuff. They found a couple of swallowtail kites um, in recent years. One of them was uh, flying around over there when I was doing some birding for Virginia Tech on the south bank of the James. I wasn't far. I wasn't able to track it down, though, but I saw you guys report it. Um, yeah. So look, look for them there. Really great um, project ongoing there. Um, let me come back to our previous slide. So we'd like to kind of transition a little bit into um, what the future kind of holds for birds in the James River uh, watershed in Virginia. Um, overwhelmingly so, bird populations are declining for the most part. Um, it is a, a fact with most of our species, unfortunately. Um, lots of different factors are coming together to do that. Loss of habitat, degradation of habitat, uh, insecticide use, um, feral cat colonies. These are all um, factors that are coming in. Invasive species um, all come together to cause the declines in our bird species. But what's going on in our watershed is an overwhelming pattern of south to north colonization into Virginia. Um, so that's really the new species that we're seeing in Virginia, the new breeders in Virginia are gonna be coming from the south. Um, it honestly, uh, coastal Virginia right now is really turning into not dissimilar to what winter in Wilmington, North Carolina used to look like. I mean, Brian and I were just at a woman's house to look for a rare hummingbird and the winter species that she had coming to her feeder, it was like I was standing in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, so that's what's coming. Um, so 70% of our colonization events have been in recent times since 1950 and 14% of our species reach their Northern and Southern limit in Virginia. So on the bottom of the screen here, we have three species that have started nesting in Virginia. And on the left there is a female and Hinga and they're fairly widespread of a nester in Virginia now. Um, it used to be kind of, what was it, Prince George or Prince George County? Mm -hmm. But I mean, they are York County. I mean, they're, they're, they're all over the southern uh, and coastal parts of our watershed now. Um, not even what I would consider a rare bird in some parts. Um, their numbers are going up. Painted buntings, um, that's the species in the middle. That's a male. Um, that's the only bird in North America that is blue, green, and red. Um, people think that they are, they have to be from South America or someplace really tropical, but no, they, they actually um, live here. And uh, they have, they started wintering in Virginia about 10 years ago, which is unusual. Um, they were at the time the only bird in the East that would winter further North than they would breed, than, than where they would breed. Um, however, they were confirmed to have started breeding in Virginia a few years ago. Yeah, that was uh, something that was found out with our latest um, breeding bird atlas, which was completed. Um, we did confirm painted buntings nesting in Virginia. And this is something that I think is going to continue. If you are in the coastal part of our watershed, um, they're coming to your feeders potentially. There are a lot of them wintering now. Um, this is a species that I'm uh, very, very familiar with. I used to, uh, it's called a painted bunting. Um, it's a species I'm extremely familiar with. Uh, I used to work on a banding study for painted buntings in North and South Carolina. So I've had hundreds of them in my hand um, and learned all about aging and um, sexing them. So the male, the adult male, or in, as we call them after second year males look like the rainbow color. Um, juvenile males look exactly like females. It's a little bit of a misnomer if you see someone saying they have a female painted bunting when they have a green bird at their feeder. Um, not necessarily true. Could be a juvenile male and it's almost impossible to tell a juvenile male from a female unless you have it in your hand. Um, but still very exciting. But the numbers are going up. I think this is a species that 
as soon as their numbers, they're starting, they're surviving here in the winter, as soon as their numbers get to a critical mass, I think this is something to expect um, in our watershed over the next 15 or 20 years. Um, they're, the habitat's exactly what they use in the South. It's not any different. Back Bay, Eastern Shore, and our residential areas identical to where I used to catch them in North and South Carolina. Um, and uh, bottom right-hand corner, that's actually the, the most recent uh, new breeder in the state of Virginia. That's a trumpeter swan. Not in our watershed, but. Not, not in our watershed, no. Um, that's in Loudoun County. Yep. So uh, we actually have two uh, species of native swan in the United States. We have tundra swans, of which uh, you can see thousands or even tens of thousands of them migrating south uh, through the state. Uh, they'll spend the winter either on Back Bay or around the Outer Banks of North Carolina, but they don't breed here. Um, like the name tundra suggests they breed in the Arctic Circle. Um, trumpeter swans were a little different. Uh, they, were, they were historical breeders here, especially around colonial times. Um, and they were pretty endangered, um, only restricted to a few habitats, mainly out west or, you know, Canada, Great Lakes, that area. And so this past uh, summer, um, they began breeding again in Loudoun County. It was really exciting. Yeah, that actually is a photo of the pair in Loudoun County. Um, and there's one wintering trumpeter swan who's been at the same pond in Waynesboro, just outside the watershed, with a petigial wing tag. Good old P61, we know it's the same one because he's got that wing tag. Um, he's there in a pond just outside Waynesboro. He's been there for several years, uh, several winters in a row now. Um, but yeah, so as far as painted bunnings go, um, they like the tiny little white millet seed, the seed that most of our birds don't eat. Painted bunnings love it. Down in the South, when we used to catch them, we used a modified crab pot in order to do that. And we would hang a white millet seed feeder inside a crab pot and they would pop in eat the white millet and we would catch them that way. Um, so that's what they like. Um, they could definitely appear at your feeder at any point really. Um, there is a rather famous male painted bunting who's hanging out on the Maryland side of Great Falls, which has been seen and delighted over by thousands at this point. Um, if you go up to go see that painted bunting, social distance. Yeah, social distance. Your mask. Social it's a very popular bird, um, which Rightly so. It's one of our most amazingly colored birds. Uh, they're actually, um, their numbers, uh, they're, they're trapped for pet trade, believe it or not. It's not something we think of happening in the U.S., but um, for painted buddings, it actually is a big problem. Um, so really exciting that that's happening. There are other species um, that certainly could move into Virginia and breed. Uh, back in 2013, I was part of the team that confirmed uh, North Carolina's first ever nesting swallowtail kite. Uh, wood storks nest in North Carolina now. Um, Rosette spoonbills nest in Georgia, and I think they are now starting to nest in South Carolina. North Carolina has nesting black-bellied whistling ducks, so things are moving north. Um, any one of those uh, could potentially uh, begin to establish in Virginia. I do think it's possible for swallowtail kites. Um, not really necessarily in our watershed. This would be like southern Virginia Beach area, um, but that's what we're seeing is south to south and north movement um, from these species that traditionally were unheard of uh, up here. So another project that um, that we did was just part of the James River Leadership Academy. Um, this is a program at JRA that we work with high school students and they learn all about leadership, improving their leadership, but their personality styles and how they interact with other um, different personalities and learning all about being environmental leaders and they do a project which is funded by JRA and so I assisted with this student's project of uh, American Kestrel boxes and these were put up at two different locations and one of our gracious uh, landowners for that one of those locations is, is with us that's why I mentioned earlier that uh, we had to some of these posts need to be straightened so Ryan and I are going to go out there and uh, <laughs> do a little bit of maintenance, um, but this is a bird that is declining in its nesting in this coastal plain area of Virginia. Highland County, everywhere, tons of kestrels, um, but as about as far east as they go is Dutch Gap. Um, so a bird that is really declining in the coastal areas, um, largely because of suitable nesting places. They need a cavity to nest in, so they might have habitat, um, but they need a cavity to nest in. So one of the things that uh, we can do is improve habitat in that way. So put out boxes for prothonotaries, 
and Kestrels is one of those as well. She was really great. She did an incredible job um, coordinating, coordinating it all. Um, hopefully we'll get some, uh, we, we, have, we have Kestrels that are hanging out around those boxes now. Um, hopefully they, they're here for the winter and they like what they see and stick around and use them. Um, other species will use the boxes as well. Um, but we would love to start to see some kestrels uh, in the coastal plain area. It's a bird that is lacking in the springtime. In the wintertime, they're around, but they kind of depart for us. Right. So yeah, I will check, take a look at the chat, but here at the end, uh, ask us about birds. That's what we do. Uh, email us with fuzzy bird pictures and out of focus bird pictures. We love that. Any questions about, you know, uh, bird feeding at home um, or anything like that. We're have, I love getting those. I get emails in my inbox with, hey, can you identify this for me? Um, happy to do that. Uh, you can find probably find our contact info at JRA staff page would be the easiest place. Um, if you go to the jamesriver.org and go to staff, you can find Ryan and myself and our uh, work emails will be in there. Something else that uh, that Brian does is run butterfly surveys around our office. Um, seeing things such as like Creole curly eyes and just tons of other different species that are basically uh, in a little mini hotspot located in Colonial National Historical Park. So if you have any butterfly questions, Brian would be pretty happy to answer those as well. I can take a look through the chat, but again, um, can find our Ryan and I's email addresses on um, our website. It's a good chance if you have a question, we can give you even more detail than we could today. Let's see if we got anything else in the chat here. There are several questions about um, kestrels, and then I saw one about a bluebird, but just in case you missed it, there's one from earlier of okay. recommendations for books and other resources as well. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, Sibley, the Sibley Field Guide is the most detailed and comprehensive one as far as getting into the nitty gritty of bird identification. Um, DWR has a lot of great online resources. Um, one of the things, if you don't have already, um, you can get an eBird account, which eBird is a massive community of data um, run by Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And um, when you go birding, people will log their checklists on eBird. And with, if you have an eBird account, you can simply go on to eBird and look at either individual places or a bird species in specific that you're interested in seeing. And you can literally go and look and see where it's being seen in the state of Virginia at any given time. Um, you can see where are the easiest places to see it, what's the best time to see it. Uh, chances are, so for example, if you went onto eBird and you typed in black pole warbler, <laughs> may at the Jamestown Glass House. Um, yeah. But that's another, it's a really great resource if you're looking for places to go bird, you can look at hotspots. Um, these hotspots are color coded by numbers of species that are, have been seen at that hotspot. Um, so like, for example, around Charlottesville, you might see the Ivy Creek Natural Area hotspot, lots of species that have been seen there. Um, it can tell you great places to go birding. Um, so it's a really great resource. Um, as far as apps on your phone, um, Merlin is really great. Um, it can really help you. It basically walks you step by step, um, getting to an identification. I think you can import a photo and do it as well. Um, it also works offline. You can download bird packs and do it offline, which is really nice. Uh, Merlin is really great. Um, so basically it'll take a bird and say, uh, what, how big was it? What was its shape? What were the main colors that you saw? So even if you're not as experienced and you can use Merlin to kind of narrow it out, it'll take into account where you are, you know, you know, the time of the year and things like that to help narrow down your, um, your search. Um, Kestrels are our small, they're a falcon, they're our smallest falcon. Um, in that photo, that was a um, male kestrel. And the males look a little bit, um, they have that blue and a little bit tawny on the back. Um, and they're a little smaller than the females, so the females a little bit streakier and a little bit bigger. Um, but they're very small and they do, um, they nest in cavities. Um, so Highland County, uh, I, I had the privilege to go and when we were working on putting this project together, 
I went out to Highland County with Patty Reum and she took me around Highland County. She monitors all of these hundreds of kestrel boxes out in Highland County. It's, it's truly amazing how many there are. Um, and so they, they're affected by pesticide spraying. They eat lots of little lizards and bugs and all kinds of things. Um, so they're really, really affected by insecticide use and um, sort of reforestation. They like open habitats as well. I saw somebody ask for a status update on bluebirds. Um, they're a bit of a success story. Yeah. Um, there are many, 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 many bluebirds in the state of Virginia now, as well as uh, as well as the east. Yeah, so they were being displaced by starlings as a competitor for cavities. Um, Ryan, if you want to keep answering the yeah. Baltimore Orioles in Virginia question. Sure. Um, so what was happening was star European starlings were introduced to the United States because somebody thought that all the birds of Shakespeare should be present in the United States. Bad. They were competing for cavities with bluebirds. And so there was a huge push in the 70s um, to save the bluebird, put up bluebird boxes. Um, and there are species that really, you know, adapts well to using your yard and to boxes. And so it's a very, very successful long-term project. And yeah, bluebirds are doing much better than they uh, than they used to. They're a thrush, so they're related to our robins. A um, little bit more striking looking, but uh, yeah, certainly one you can get to your home. Uh, of course, mealworm dishes. Um, you may be, they can be a little picky about the box. If you put a box out and they don't like it, um, maybe move it to a little bit different location. Um, facing it southwest helps um, and more open. Common loons, um, now, this is the time of year to see them. Um, they like, you'll see them in more open water. Uh, we have two species um, that are pretty easy to find, like uh, common loons as well as red-threaded loons. Um, we did get lucky and we did see a Pacific loon, actually. Um, I was actually out on uh, Back River, so not in the James River. Yeah, so the common loon's the bigger one. They got that big bill. They come down in the winter. They look nothing like the pictures you'll see of common loons um, on the internet with that striking. And when they, before they leave in March, you can actually sometimes hear them call, which is sort of a weird thing to hear on the James River. <laughs> um, but there are tons of common loons out right now. Going to be the more common of the two on the river. Um, you do probably need to be closer to the coast for a red-throated loon. They're yeah. a little bit slighter. The bill kind of goes up a little. Um, no red throat on the red throated loon in winter time, unfortunately. <laughs> I did see a question earlier um, about American robins. Someone was asking if they were coming back from the south. Um, so it's a bit of a misnomer. American robins actually don't really migrate in this part of the country. Um, you just don't really see them in your yard in the winter time. In the winter, they're out in the woods and they're feeding on fruit and berries. Uh, if you see a holly bush, um, dozens of them will can descend on them and eat the berries and occasionally those berries can become fermented and then you can see a bunch of trunk robins as well as some other birds uh, they can do that like titmice um, cedar waxwings things like that but during the spring the robins will move out of the woods and they'll uh, sort of move into, into residential areas and uh, they'll then there you'll see them feeding on like worms and insects and things like that. That's what they're feeding their chicks. Yeah, interestingly, someone just asked about you were talking about red berries and holly berries. They were talking actually about cedar waxwings. Yeah, and that's another one that's going to utilize those red winter berries. Um, they're kind of nomadic, so the question is about attracting them. Um, they love holly berries, so American holly is really great. Yeah. Um, they're kind of sort of hit or miss. They roam in, in these voracious packs. They can hit your house clean out your berry bush in a day they'll like use a pine tree as their little sallying from place and come down to your bush and eat all those red berries and as ryan was saying they can get a little drunk if those yep. berries have fermented a little bit uh, so it's kind of hit or miss year to year whether you're going to have a flock of cedar wax wings or not um, there's other plant species that produce berries this time of year that they're going to utilize as well but american holly is definitely the native of choice Rich, when did the, when will the ospreys return to build their nests? Well, they haven't really left this year, uh, so we do have quite a few overwintering ospreys. Um, 
again, like in the springtime, like April, May, that's when many of our breeding birds will return. Yeah, ospreys are starting to not necessarily leave. We had last winter an osprey spend the winter at Jamestown Island. They're kind of regularly wintering on the eastern shore in Virginia Beach now. Um, typically, they do leave. Um, our bald eagles um, will st are starting to nest now, and ospreys will kind of start later in the spring. So as the bald eagle chicks are fledging, the ospreys will get going. Um, I like to say ospreys have figured out marriage as their pairs, because the pairs will come together for the nesting season, and they will depart, and they will not necessarily spend the winter even in the same place. One might be in Florida, one might be in the Caribbean somewhere but they will um, return to the nesting site on the same day as each other sometimes. Um, the, um, right around Jamestown Island on the causeway, there's probably four pairs or five pairs of osprey. Um, the Chesapeake Bay, I, I think Hundreds. some of the estimates have it as a quarter of the world's population of osprey. It's, it's astounding. Um, they're much better at catching fish than eagles because they have hooked fish hook, circle hook talons. Um, so they'll be, they, there's a few around right now, but they'll be coming back in April and you'll start to see them. Great question. Excellent, any other questions? Yeah, talking about berry bushes. So yeah, the, the real native for those berries are gonna be our American hollies. Yep. They're gonna be the best native. We're talking native plants there. But yeah, it's, you can't really, if you have the berry plants in your yard, you know, you can get them. It's just going to be whether you get a flock that comes by or not. Um, that being said, Nandinas are not good berry plants. No. Their, their berries are actually poisonous yes. to birds. <laughs> yes, they so, are. So if um, I would encourage you, if you do have Nandinas in the yard, uh, maybe think about replacing them with a native uh, alternative instead. Yeah, someone mentioned wax berries and, or wax myrtles and winter hollies are both native. And those are Fabulous great plants. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got a question for Great Blue Heron rookeries. So my knowledge of Great Blue Heron rookeries all across the state is a little bit limited. Um, so one, play, one thing you can do also with eBird is you can go into the Virginia Breeding Bird Atlas 2 portal on eBird and it will show you nesting data um, for the state of Virginia if you're uh, familiar with eBird. So we do have a Great Blue Heron rookery that is um, down by the Lions Bridge is a really great one to see. They're up in all the trees around um, Lions Bridge in Newport News. Uh, they're sitting up there right now. Um, and then all across, all along the river, probably from the fall line up to certainly around Mayo Bridge. I, I, I mean, I would say from, you know, from the fall line and pipeline and, and just go up through, um, basically through all the bridges in Richmond, a lot of on the south bank of Richmond, huge. Great Bull Heron Rookery moves a little bit from year to year in downtown Richmond. Um, but yeah, that's a big one as well. Um, anywhere along water, they like to nest colonially, so together up in the tops of pine trees. Um, and you can hear them. They'll, they'll be like rock, 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 come uh, sort of late winter, very early spring. And then by late spring, it'll be pretty stinky. <laughs> underneath where those nests are. Um, so yeah, around ponds, along the river, um, you can, and on our tributaries of the river, up in tall trees is where they're gonna be. Um, what would be a little bit harder to find along the nesting is green herons, our smallest heron. That's a really great bird. It can be seen along the river. Um, keep your eye out for that. They certainly nest in and around our great bull herons as well, a little bit farther down usually. Um, but good question. Yeah, so I see someone said pipeline in Richmond. Yeah, so those birds are probably coming from the South Bank rookery, a lot of them. Um, and a lot of times those great bull herons that you see in the same place, if you think, if you've ever thought, is that the same bird? It probably is, or one of the same birds. Um, they're pretty specific to sites. Um, they've done a lot of interesting studies with great bull herons. They're big enough to support a GPS and accelerometer backpack that piggybacks onto cell towers. And we can, what scientists can actually do is they can tell what that great blue heron is doing at any given moment. Is it walking, soaring, flapping? Did it just strike for a fish, flapping hard, sleeping? And they can actually calculate energy usage 
per bird for a year. Like how much food is it going to have to eat to meet a certain what the energy it used that they can tell. It's amazing um, what, how technology has, has gotten into the study of birds, but I, I've seen several research, um, research work done on great blue herons with that. And so that's where they learned that it probably is the same great blue heron that you're seeing at your pond. They eat lots of stuff, not just fish, frogs, eels, snakes, baby um, muskrats. Other birds. Other birds. They don't care. At Holy <laughs> Meadows in Fairfax, they eat goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> and then get eaten by snapping turtles. And, yeah. <laughs> Circle of life. Circle of life. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions? Uh, we're about at the end of our scheduled time. There are just two more from before. Um, they're kind of related. One is, has our watershed lost birds from moving north due to climate change? And the other one is, are there many species that have left here to move north? It's a good question. Um, Bewick's wind is certainly one that, that may have been a contributing factor um, as habitat change um, with bringing in house wrens, kind of pushing them out. Um, I think the worry, the primary worry with losing nesting species for our watershed is going to be in our higher elevation habitats. Um, you have to think of it basically as the lower habitats, as our averages, temperatures, and other things change, they're going to start to move up the mountain. And those habitats at the top are going to get squeezed out. They've got nowhere to go. It's nothing but sky up there. Um, like for example, the high elevation relic um, habitats at the tops of the North Carolina mountains, that, that there's no habitat that's like that until you go up to Canada. Um, so there is, a, there is certainly a, a possibility of us losing breeding species um, from that over time. So things like Blackburnian warbler, uh, red crossbill, is another one um, that's a little bit harder to see in the watershed, but there are mountains in Virginia uh, at the very top where we could start to lose species like that that are reliant on those upper habitats. Um, so as far as you know, climate change, you know, things that are are moving back north. I think another thing we're we're going to start to see is um, you know sea level rise. Our water as water comes up, um, we're going to start to lose the higher parts of our marshes that are really important for rails. Um, if you develop houses up to the marsh and the water comes up, the high marsh there, that is sort of not the heavily inundated, but kind of inundated, it's got nowhere to go. It's the mountain thing all over again. Um, whereas it, under normal circumstances, it would just migrate naturally back. If you've got a hard barrier there in your house, it's not going to do that. Um, so those are kind of the ways that we could potentially lose species um, with regards to that. Any bird walks or trips planned? Yeah. Uh, so we do have uh, these connect with the James paddles um, that will resume in the springtime. And we do uh, plan on having two or three that are going to be birding focused. And we hope to catch uh, the spring migration with that. So I also, I'm putting the park name in the chat. Um, I run the bird walks for Elizabeth River Project at Paradise Creek Nature Park. And those are typically the third Saturday of the month. So I think the ones we have coming up are February 20th and March 20th. Um, we don't have spring scheduled out yet, um, but we will. And those run from 8.30 to 10. And so that's at Paradise Creek Nature Park. If you go to um, Paradise Creek Nature Park's website and go to their public programs, um, you can register for those walks there if you want to go birding with me. Um, another way to do some walks potentially is with your local clubs. Um, so that's a great way to get involved in the birding community. So we have the statewide organization, but uh, in different regions, you have bird clubs. Um, Brian mentioned Williamsburg Bird Club. We have Hampton Roads Bird Club. Virginia Beach has clubs, Richmond area. Um, you know, getting involved with them and looking at what their uh, regular walks and various field trips are. It's a great way. Um, as long as we can be safe, it's a great way to get out to baby areas you haven't been with folks who are really um, experienced and you can learn a lot and see a lot from these walks. Um, I can just say that uh, the Paradise Creek Nature Park walks, um, I'm going to be trying to show 
everyone who comes as many species as well as I can. Um, that's really the focus of those walks is um, trying to get as many people on as many good looks at birds as possible. So those will hopefully be continuing um, throughout the year. Linda, the mountains are absolutely going to be your best place to see red poles. Um, although one did turn up at a feeder in, in Richmond area. Yeah, and uh, when it snowed the other it's day. It's a pretty rare bird for Virginia, common red pole. Um, there's certainly, I believe, a few of them around this year, just with the way that the southward eruption of our boreal finches, those group of birds has been. Not a lot of them have turned up. Usually, usually when they get turned up, it's because one came to a feeder. Um, I think the snow drove one in a group of purple finches to a feeder. Um, very, there's a lot of, a lot of birders in this state who would love to see come in red pole. Um, you're looking at two of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're a little bit over our time, so I don't see any, uh, any other additional questions. This might be a good place to end, but thank you guys so much. Brian, thank you for telling us about CVWO. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. So um, the JamesRiver.org um, is our main page. On the staff page, you can find myself and Ryan. Our emails will be there. Um, great way to shoot us any questions, bird IDs, or anything. Um, we can give some more detailed responses. If um, anybody has any questions for me, you can share my email if you want to. Okay, sure. Where's that? Uh, just gonna type that in the chat really fast. We'll be sending out some uh, links to some of these things that we've been uh, talking about, as well as uh, the recording of our presentation will be available uh, through JRA as well. So thank you guys for spending the evening thank with you. us. Thank you. Great. You don't have yeah. to twist Ryan and I's arm to no. talk about birds. We'll do it for <laughs> hours and hours if we're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, y'all.